From the book of Luke, chapter 17, verses 21 through 22, it says, 20 through 21. And when he was demanded of the Pharisees, when the kingdom of God should come, he answered them and said, the kingdom of God cometh not with observation. Neither shall they say, lo here or lo there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. Let's end those words of our beloved Lord Jesus. Teresa of Avila said, all harm comes to us from failing to realize that God is near. Back in January, I was privileged to give a teaching about Lady Master Christine, who was last embodied as a chila of the Ascended Masters as Florence Jeanette Miller in this era, who made her ascension in the light in 1979. We spoke of one of Florence's most famous embodiments as Teresa of Avila, the 16th century Spanish mystic. Today, I thought it would be worth going back to study in more depth the saint's most profound spiritual writing, the interior castle. But also, how does this teaching relate to what is happening in today's world? in this land we call America? And how does the larger picture of our own spiritual awareness and consciousness change the picture of the earth and what will happen? So I will not simply describe these seven mansions or dwelling places that Teresa of Avila describes in the interior castle, but what the ascended masters also have said through the years on the importance of the building of this fortress of light within us as the greatest protection of our soul's ultimate victory. According to an account by Teresa to her early biographer, Diego de Yepes, Teresa received the entire image of the book interior castle in a vision on Trinity Sunday on 1577. Now, what is Trinity Sunday? Well, it is the first Sunday after Pentecost in the Western liturgical calendar. And it is the Trinity Sunday celebrates the Christian doctrine of the Trinity, the three persons of God, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we'll read from a teaching from Elizabeth Clare Prophet, who gave this in 1978 on the importance of the three aspects of God in the threefold flame of our own interior castle of our hearts. This biographer, Jepes, also Teresa's former confessor, as she was a nun, stated she beheld a most beautiful crystal globe, like a castle in which she saw seven dwelling places or mansions and in the seventh which was in the center the king of glory dwelt in the greatest splendor he beautified and illumined all those dwelling places to the outer wall the inhabitants received more light the nearer they were to the center outside of the castle all was darkness with toads vipers and other poisonous vermin while she was admiring this beauty, which the grace of God communicates to souls, the light suddenly disappeared. And although the king of glory did not leave the castle, the crystal was covered with darkness and was left as coal and with unbearable stench. And the poisonous creatures outside the wall were able to get into the castle. Such was the state of a soul in sin. And those that dwell outside the first dwelling here, a learned man told Teresa, souls without prayer are like people whose bodies and limbs are paralyzed. Even though they have hands and feet, they cannot give orders to these hands and feet. 
Thus there are souls so ill and so accustomed to being involved in external matters that there is no remedy, nor does it seem they can enter within themselves. They are now so used to dealing always with the insects and vermin that are in the wall surrounding the castle that they have become almost like them. And though they have so rich a nature and the power to converse with none other than God, there is no remedy. If these souls do not strive to understand and cure their great misery, they will be changed into statues of salt, unable to turn their heads to look at themselves, just as Lot's wife was changed for having turned her head. That's from the interior castle, the introduction. Within this castle is a complex spiritual life involving the individual's capacities, the diversity of ways and spiritual depths. There are many other dwellings as well to the sides and the top and the bottom with fountains and gardens and labyrinths, delightful things that you would like to be dissolved in praises of the great God who created the soul in his own image and likeness. The center is God's dwelling place. The gate of entry, says Teresa, is prayer. Prayer is a door that opens up into the mystery of God and at the same time, a means of communing with him. I came across a theological thesis entitled The Path and the Castle. And I found as I researched Teresa of Avila and her writings that many, many people have studied her. She's very popular and she was very popular in her day. And this thesis compares the path of the Buddha with this Christian mystic. And the seven mansions or the seven dwelling places that she goes through in this vision are categorized into three areas with seven definitions of attainment for each dwelling place, which I'd like to go through now. So we already heard about what was outside the castle. It sounded rather frightening. So once you're in to the first level of this castle, the first mansion, we have three different levels within the seven mansions. And the first three levels are called the via purgativa or the purging, the purging level of maybe the transmutation in our violet flame language. The first mansion, is the mental prayer. And that is described as contemplative prayer. And that was what Teresa of Avila was very focused on, the mental prayer. And she brought that to the reformed Carmelite uh, nunnery with, that she began. She began that because she found that the first time she joined the Carmelites, it was rather became rather arid to her or dry. And she did not feel like people, the nuns were feeling, the sisters were feeling the essence of God within them. So she began her own nunnery and her own convent, the reformed Carmelites. So this mental prayer in the first mansion, again, is the contemplative prayer, is nothing else than a close sharing between friends, says Teresa. It means taking time frequently to be alone with him, who we know loves us. Here the emphasis is on love rather than on thought. So it is beginning this feeling within you to have the feeling of the prayer. The second mansion or second dwelling is discursive. That's D-I-S-C-U-R-S-I-V-E and effective A-F-F-E-C-T-I-V-E -E, prayer. So the form of prayer of the discursive prayer is which the reflections of the mind are more active than the affections of the will. It is called discursive because discursion is the act of the mind that proceeds from one truth to the knowledge of another truth, either about the same object or something else. So you know a truth and that leads to another and another. 
The affective prayer is a kind of prayer in which the emphasis is on making aspirations of love towards God, rather than on formulating petitions or engaging in discursive reflection. The third mansion or dwelling is the prayer of recollection, active and passive. So remember these first three mansions or dwellings are in the category of the purgation, the via purgativa. And this third mansion is called recollection. The prayer is called recollection because the soul collects its faculties together and enters within itself to be with its God. It is about deliberately renouncing any activities to the exterior senses, particularly sight and hearing. So anyone who walks this path keeps his eyes closed almost as often as he prays. So we often hear about the distractions when we do our decrees, when we do our prayers. And this is one of the most difficult portions in the lower areas to overcome, to really get into the center without distractions or thoughts of other things. This active or turning within to listen to the voice of grace is called recollection. And this term expresses the act whereby the soul gathers and collects itself into itself, those powers of attention hitherto scattered and divided among many objects. There are two kinds of recollection, as we said, active and passive. The one which is active and is the work of the will aided by grace, and the other which is passive and is the gift of God. The latter is usually the reward of the former after it has been faithfully practiced over a period of time. The first object of active recollection is the custody of the senses, especially of the sight and hearing, which are, as it were, the windows through which the soul looks out and busies itself with passing things. When the soul is thus, for the most part, attentive to all that is going on outside itself, it cannot keep watch with him, nor give heed to the interior master who seeks to instruct and correct him. It cannot so much as hear his words. So now we're going into the area, which is via illuminativa, the illumination. And this is the fourth mansion or dwelling and is the prayer of quiet as we go deeper into this journey to the heart. As a name implies the prayer of quiet, is that in which the soul experiences an extraordinary peace and rest accompanied by delight or pleasure in contemplating God as present. In this prayer, God gives to the soul an intellectual knowledge of his presence and makes it feel that it is really in communication with him, although he does it in a somewhat obscure manner. The manifestation increases in distinctness as a union with God becomes a higher order. This mystic gift cannot be acquired because it is supernatural. It is God himself who makes his presence felt in the inmost soul. So we have taken out the distractions and we are in this middle place, this fourth mansion, this fourth dwelling place where we have realized the light of God. And we go on to the next set of three, the fifth, sixth, and seventh. And this area is called the Via Unitiva, or unity area. The fifth mansion is a prayer of simple union. The soul now goes deeper into prayer to unite herself to God in what is appropriately called the prayer of union. And some scholars call this prayer the prayer of incipient union or the prayer of the sleep of the faculties. It means you're shutting off all of those things, those ears, those eyes, and going completely within to shut out the externals. And here the soul falls asleep to the things of the world. And in this sort of death becomes united to God 
Thus, the faculties are suspended, and there is virtually an unconsciousness as the soul appears to have withdrawn from the body. The hallmark experience of this prayer is the certainty that, however short in duration, the soul was united to God. Many of you have had that experience. I remember probably 25 to 30 years ago or more, and I was sitting at my altar and meditating on the I Am Presence chart, which many of us do. And that chart has a great ability to take us and focus us into the heart of God. And indeed, that one time I can remember doing my prayers and decrees and staring at the chart and the chart came alive. It became three dimensional and it was around me. And it was, it was like a bubble that you did not want to burst. It was like such a fragile thing that you hardly wanted to move. And it was an enlightenment. So it speaks here of however short in duration, the soul was united to God. So you really felt as if you were in your presence. And I'm sure you have also had those experiences in your spiritual work. Teresa explains this fifth mansion and she says, God implants himself in the interior of that soul in such a way that when it returns to itself, it cannot possibly doubt that God has been in it and it has been in God. So firmly does this truth remain within it that although for years God may never grant it that favor again, it can never forget it or doubt that it has received it. This, cert this certainty of the soul is very material. End of that quote. Teresa compares the soul's growth and progress in a celebrated analogy. She liked to use a lot of simple terms. Teresa did not have a higher education. She was a simple woman. She went to the convent without an outer education of any sort of much. And so she wrote very simply and she was very humble. And so she wrote what God gave her. And so she used this analogy of the silkworm. She said, this large and ugly worm appears to be almost dead in the winter. But when the warm weather comes, it begins to feed on mulberry leaves and then to spin silk from twigs on the ground as it makes itself into a very tight cocoon. And this really woke me up because I grew up on a farm and along the road by the fields of our farm, there were several rows of mulberry trees. And I remember every summer, early summer, there were all these tents of the silkworms. They took over the entire tree. So she goes on to say, Then finally, the worm comes right out of the cocoon and it's a beautiful white butterfly. Likewise, the soul spins its own cocoon through penance, prayer, and mortification until it becomes hidden in God. When it becomes quite dead to the things of the world, it comes out a little white butterfly. Having experienced the prayer of union, the soul now has the most vehement desire for penance, solitude, and for all to know God. Have you experienced that on your path? You wanted everyone to know about the teachings. You wanted everyone to know what you had discovered in your own soul. It is overwhelmed for having merited such a blessing, your soul. The soul is now being prepared for the betrothal to the king, which will take place in the sixth mansion. Teresa warns the soul to remain humble for the power of hell is still capable of winning the soul back to sin. The soul is still susceptible to the perils of pride and self-delusion. Self-love must be crushed. The soul must keep her eyes fixed on the king's greatness and grow in love. Love is never idle. The soul must keep advancing. So we are still in this unit, unity, area, the sixth mansion, the sixth dwelling, is spiritual betrothal. Entrance into the sixth mansion 
marks the transition from the illuminative stage of the journey to the unitive stage. The soul has fallen deeply in love with the King, the Holy Christ self, and is now ready for spiritual betrothal to him. However, the journey through the sixth mansion will not be without danger and affliction, and to persevere the soul will have to suffer much. Oh my God, Teresa laments, how great are these trials which the soul will suffer, both within and without, before it enters the seventh mansion. Still, the suffering to be experienced by the soul in the sixth mansion will be counterbalanced by many mystical experiences. The soul undergoes of a truly amazing nature. It is in the sixth mansion that the soul begins to experience extraordinary mystical phenomena that one associates with some of the great saints of which we know of, even in our age, like Padre Pio, who bore the stigmata, John Bosco. These experiences of God, which Teresa is recounting from her own personal experience, include locutions, visions, raptures, ecstasies. There is a beautiful statue I'd just like you to look up because it is so beautiful. It's the ecstasy of Saint Teresa of Avila and it's in Rome and it's done by the sculptor Bernini. It is just a beautiful focus and I would like to recommend you look that up. Tearful desire to be taken out of this earthly exile, flights of the spirit and jubilations. Teresa explains these experiences in significant detail. In her book, this is the longest chapter. It has 11 chapters describing the sixth mansion, but cautions the soul not to rely on them for the fear the soul might think too highly of itself or even become delusional. Now you have to understand that Teresa was born in 1515 and died in 1585, she died at 67. And that was the time of the Spanish Inquisition or the latter part of the Spanish Inquisition, which is when Spain wanted to become primarily Catholic and they took Jews or, or uh, Muslims, if they were not, if they were trying to become a Christian, then they could be brought up for trial for heresy, if it looked like they were just becoming a Christian for the sake of saving their souls from the, the folks who were going against them, but that they could become or stay a Jew or a Muslim, but it was not encouraged, but it was only the Christians that at that time that were looked upon and scrutinized for heresy. So she had to be very careful when she was told by her confessors to write the books that she did she wrote them with great humility because these kind of experiences of levitation, for instance, could make her look like she was becoming greater than God. And that was always a sign for the clergy to look upon her as possible delusionment or, or becoming greater than, than God in her own mind. So she had to be very careful to constantly constantly in her writings to give deference to her confessors, to the men, because they were the head of the church. And so she was very clever in the way she wrote and very humble. It says, mixed in with these ecstatic experiences are terrible times of suffering. In the mansion three, the king tested the soul's resolve by subjecting it to profound period of aridity or dryness. And passing this test, the soul moved on to mansion four, entering the illuminative stage and experiencing infused prayer. To enter into the mansion seven, the soul is going to have to withstand even greater hardships. These hardships include physical illness, depressions, persecutions, and even seemingly insignificant trials like backbiting and undeserved praise. Teresa tells the soul that some of these sufferings are comparable only with the tortures of hell. And yet the soul bears it all because of her intense love for the King, her holy Christ self. Teresa calms the soul by encouraging her not to neglect 
meditative prayer. The soul is not to restrict itself to contemplative prayer or infused prayer. It is beneficial that the soul meditate on the sacred humanity of Jesus, on the Blessed Virgin Mary, and on the lives of the saints. Teresa is really making a very important philosophical point here in the sixth mansion that the world of supernatural prayer cannot be separated from the categorical world of time and space. And thus, practicing meditative prayer keeps the soul grounded in reality and protected from delusion. This is a practical warning from Teresa that the soul should not chase after mystical phenomena unless it is firmly rooted in the historical faith of Christianity. The soul in the sixth mansion has been on a roller coaster ride, experiencing the highs of many phenomenal mystical experiences and the lows of many trials and afflictions. And it is said that Teresa would tell her sister she was so embarrassed by her levitation during mass that she had her sisters actually try to hold her down. So she was becoming the saint in action. She weathered the storm and she's ready to enter the peaceful confines of the seventh mansion. And this is the place where only the king dwells. The seventh mansion or dwelling is the spiritual marriage. When the soul comes to the seventh mansion, she enters into spiritual marriage with her bridegroom, the king. The soul has penetrated to the very center of itself where his majesty alone dwells. Teresa refers to this place in the soul as the second heaven. The soul is brought into this mansion by means of an intellectual vision where the most holy trinity reveals itself in all three persons. And remember, she got this vision on Trinity Sunday. Here all three persons communicate themselves to the soul and speak to the soul. Teresa is no doubt recounting here what she experienced when she entered the seventh mansion. She indicates that in addition to this experience, she also granted a vision of Jesus in great splendor, beauty, and majesty having receiving commute after receiving communion. Jesus spoke to her at that moment. And there are many wonderful effects produced in the soul as a result of this spiritual marriage. And these are some of those instances. A self-forgetfulness, which is so complete that it really seems as though the soul no longer existed. So entirely is she employed seeking the honor of God. And also, there is produced in the soul a great desire to suffer, and the soul bears no enmity to those who ill-treat them. She bears, they bear no enmity to those who ill-treat them. The soul also has a marked detachment from everything, experiences no aridities or dryness or interior trials, but always maintains a tender love for the Lord wanting always to give him praise. The soul experiences almost constant tranquility. The soul has no lack of crosses, but they do not unsettle the soul's peace. The soul loses its fear and acquires great strength to serve the Lord and the church. The soul is ready to bear any cross for the love of the bridegroom. Fear evaporates. The soul experiences the almost constant presence of the bridegroom. So in the seventh mansion, Teresa returns to the analogy and the image of the silkworm to help describe the transformation of the soul that has undergone in the seventh mansion. The worm, which after much toil and labor emerged from its cocoon, a beautiful white butterfly in the fifth mansion, now dies, and with the greatest joy, because Christ is now its life. The soul is now endowed with the life of God. St. Paul said, I have been crucified with Christ. I live, not I, but Christ lives in me. 
is illustrative of what has happened to the soul. In fact, Teresa points to Paul as a preeminent example of this total transformation in Christ for having so completely united himself to the Lord through visions and prayer and contemplation. He was ready to suffer terrible trials for the Lord, never remaining idle. You read about Paul in the Bible. He was a busy man. Teresa ends her book by reminding her nuns that prayer is not a thing in and of itself, as if for personal enjoyment and to satisfy a quest for mystical phenomena. Rather, prayer is necessary to acquire the strength that makes one fit for service and to lead souls to God. She also reminds her nuns that humility is the foundation of the interior castle. Humility is the foundation of the interior castle. She says, without humility, all will be lost. So we've gone through all these levels of the mansion, of the dwellings, of the interior castle. So coming back to what I said earlier, I spoke of earlier, how does all of this relate to us today in a vastly different world than that of a cloistered female mystic in the 16th century? I would say that Teresa of Avila did not just come out a saint as no one has, because we've all had our karma, we've all had our desires, and we've all had our, our challenges and our initiations. She said she wasted 20 years of her life in that embodiment, finally figuring out what she was supposed to do. She spent it in the first convent, the Carmelite convent, where she experienced that aridity or that dryness of the soul. And that's when she decided to start her own. And she was allowed because she had a great respect from her confessors and they saw her as a spiritual leader. Although she was very, again, she was in much deference to them. But what part of our society encourages us in this hour to the inner life? It seems to be further and further from us how do we do this in this day and age? We seem to be so sophisticated, but yet we are so far from what we have just described here. Few people, fewer people go into the cloistered life. I came across a lecture by Elizabeth Clare Prophet, beloved Guru Ma, from 1978, October 1978, and I transcribed the, the video, the words, the psychology of socialism, the religion of hatred, the cult of death. And she spoke in this lecture and said, well, what does that have to do with what you just spoke about? Well, she spoke in there, the platform of having the platform of America to work out our Christhood, to have capitalism with a Christian nation and how that gives us the platform and that to become the Christ. It is the most important place on the planet or has been. And that's why people throng here because they recognize the I am race recognizes that platform for the potential of their own Christhood. So she spoke of, and I'm going to read an excerpt that I did transcribe from her teaching on the importance of the balancing of the threefold flame, the effect of socialism and communism on the soul's development. So she said, she was talking of the threefold flame and of desires, and she said, love, the action of the will impetus with the wisdom. So without love, there is no creativity. Love is the free freedom, random interaction of souls. Life waves, communities, families, people, it is spontaneous. And there is no other form of love but spontaneous love. It cannot be regimented because it is always the grace and the gift of God. And it is the descent of the Holy Ghost. That is the gift of love. Love that is non-possessive 
mutually satisfying because it is the fulfillment of the divine plan of all who share in this love. So she says, you see, socialism and communism are a regimentation of will, a regimentation of knowledge or understanding or science and a regimentation of love. The whole system collapses because it puts to death the Trinity and its action within the individual. Now we've all lived in our own various incarnations, either as a result of personal or community, individual or collective experience. We've all had situations where in minute increments or greater increments, this process of the Trinity has been tampered with and compromised. And it is the full consciousness of the Trinity that we are striving for as we become chilas of the ascended masters. They know that we cannot survive and we cannot function until we balance and expand the threefold flame. That is the foundation of your path, to expand those three aspects of God's consciousness. And the definition of the Christ is, is one who has power, wisdom, love, with perfect balance within its being, body, mind, and soul. Memory, the threefold flame must be in balance and blazing and command in the desire body and the subconscious. It must be balanced and it must be blazing. And the memory, which is also interacting with the desire body in the subconscious because it holds the records. It must be in the mind and it must be in the physical body. Now she says, this is the end of this quote from Elizabeth Clare Prophet. Now, if the level then of the human habit pattern of this laziness, she says, this flabbiness of the four lower bodies and of the soul is not transmuted, the individual then will go, will then will in all likelihood recreate the identical pattern and the identical karma, even though he has attained freedom from that previous karma. End of that quote from that teaching. So I wanted to bring that up because sometimes we hear these teachings from mystics from the Bible and we think, oh, that doesn't happen anymore. But we know in this activity, maybe we're more like that than the Catholic Church is today. We have the experience of the teachings of the Ascended Masters and we know that Teresa of Avila reincarnated as Jeanette Miller, Florence Jeanette Miller, and became Lady Master Christine. And think of the work that she did in that lifetime. And she came to discover the science of the spoken word. And we know that the decree, as it is said in the science of the spoken word, the decree is the most powerful of all applications to the Godhead. It is the command of the son or daughter of God made in the name of the I am presence and the Christ for the will of the almighty to come into manifestation as above, so below. <clears throat> it is the means whereby the kingdom of God, remember that kingdom of God is within you, becomes a reality here and now through the power of the spoken word. So we have this wonderful tool, the science of the spoken word and the violet flame, which Teresa and her sisters did not have at that time. It seemed it was a more arduous path, but we have more tools. And sometimes as Guru Ma says, there becomes a flabbiness or a laziness of the, of the mental body to continue in the path. The more things we are given, it seems sometimes the less we give. I came across some other references to the interior castle, which I like to read from several ascended masters. Before we go into that, those excerpts, I like us to turn to our bulletins today and there is a poem that Teresa of Avila wrote. 
and this was this beautiful poem is in your bulletin and we're taking an excerpt from it which it repeats three times it's called <clears throat> nada de terbe let nothing trouble you excuse my spanish we'll sing this in spanish in the bolded type three times and it said that they found this on her breviary, St. Teresa's breviary, when she was dying. That was her little prayer book that she used. And she wrote out this poem. And it's a simple format, which you may turn to in distress if you're feeling afraid or anxious. And sit, consider praying this prayer, opening your heart to God, adding your own words. And it's basically translated, let nothing disturb you, let nothing frighten you, all things are passing away. God never changes. Patience obtains all things. Whoever has God lacks nothing. God alone suffices. So let us turn to our bulletins and we'll have the music now and sing together Nada de Terbe. I'd like to read an excerpt from a dictation from Mother Mary, where she refers to this interior castle from volume 31, number 51 from 1988. Mother Mary says, there is balance in this path, beloved. Asceticism is not the way. In fact, Aquarius is the age of the family, the age of the individual, the age of a mandala of light bearers who exult in the buoyant light rising as children who do play in the sun, whose perpetual joy is the miracle, the natural upward flow. She says, you need no longer be disappointed in the shallow ones and their shallow relationships, nor in a love that cannot contain the vastness of thy interior castle. Be not dismayed. The trees only grow so high and the cup has only such a circumference. Curse not then the vessel that is too small but raise up thine own and fill it full, that millions may drink therefrom. Do not expect too much of those who cannot contain, for they have no containers for the infinite. A couple more expert excerpts I'm going to share with you from Pearls of Wisdom. The masters 
have almost many of them have all referred to this interior castle. And one of them was a dictation in 1992 from St. Joseph, our beloved St. Germain, Pearl 35, number 26. And it should be noted that St. Therese's first convent of the Reformed Carmelites was called St. Joseph's. She said, or St. Joseph said, therefore you are the issue of God. Beware for those who are not the issue of God who wander about as I have said, seeking whom they may devour, have played with you. And with some of you, they've had a heyday. You have been moved this way and that way. You've been seized with an idea that they have planted you followed it in its burst as a bubble, taking with it your supply and your very lifeblood. And then you've gone another way and this away and that away instead of first seating yourself in the place of the Holy of Holies of your heart chakra with your Holy Christ self and simply saying, so let us say together, I'll repeat after me this affirmation of St. Joseph. Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God and that the I am that I am within me is that God and that the I am that I am within me is that God and I will not be moved from my course of service to my God and I will not be moved from my course of service to my God. He finishes by saying any distraction will do, any stray thought, just to get you away from your own interior castle, your own inner altar, and the altar of the Most High God. Shananda, our Indian master, in 1981, Pearl 24, number 23, said the only castle that is fortified as a fortress of light is the castle in whom dwells the night, who knows his God dwelleth with him. Only that knight can defend that castle in the king's name, who knows that God is. God is the inner being who is omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent. And Kuthumi, our beloved Kuthumi gave a whole dictation volume, which I will not read but an excerpt from, but it is called Peace in the Interior Castle, volume 55, number five. It was given back in 1978, War as Vengeance of the Fallen Ones Against the Lord God. And just an excerpt from our beloved Kuthumi, who also in the 12th century was our beloved St. Francis of Assisi. He talks about the threefold flame and the thrust of the threefold flame. He says, understand then that there is a science to the thrusting of light into the body of God. You must then not be taken unaware when you feel the reaction to our thrust of power and wisdom and love. Remember, Guru Ma spoke of that. Know that you must understand that there is that point, counterpoint. And with every release of light, you then, following the giving of the spoken word, must be still even for a minute, as you clasp your hands to your heart and go within and visualize the great sphere of light and know that the reaction to the light you have sent forth when it comes can only then touch the great sphere of cosmic consciousness that emanates from the interior castle of your heart. And that sphere of light will transmute or repel as the law requires all that is anti-light, anti-Christ. End of the quote from beloved Kuthumi, our St. Francis. Our beloved Jesus gave a dictation on his Ascension Day in 1981, which I encourage you to read, The Memory of Your Soul Under the Lamb of God. He gave it directly to Elizabeth Clare Provitt as the messenger. He addressed it to her. It's in volume 24, number 29. And he talks about the purging. When you're in the experience of purging, when in the sense of aloneness, like St. John of the cross, 
and feeling now the presence and now the absence of your Lord. When you feel the trials coming and going, you know you are moving upward. The light of God always prevails. The light of God always prevails. The light of God always prevails.